Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is the fifth part, the last part, of my lecture titled 50 Years of Music Synthesis. When I was in high school in St. Louis many moons ago, local stores like Dale's Music and McMurray Music had stacks of Roland TB303s that nobody wanted. The TB303 was intended to emulate a bass guitar, but it was terrible at emulating a bass guitar. As with a lot of other musical instruments that producers in the late 80s and early 90s could pick up cheaply at the time, musicians figured out that you can make the TB303 make a lot of crazy sounds if you let go of the idea of trying to make it sound like a bass guitar. In particular, you could crank the resonance to the max and this thing would absolutely squeal and the genre of music known as Acid House was born. And like with other instruments, when the demand started going up, prices started going up. When I first created this set of slides and looked in 2006, I noted that prices ranged between $700 and $1,100. And let's take a look at eBay now. Okay. <laughs> wow. All right, so let's make this something more like $3,000 to $4,000 in 2020. If I had a time machine and could go back and tell my younger self to pick up a bunch of these TB303s and stash them, that would have been a good investment. And unsurprisingly, being a popular synthesizer, it was the subject of computer-based recreations. And actually, Propellerhead's Rebirth, I don't think it's really the first software synthesizer, but it's definitely one of the earliest. Now, given the power of modern computers and their flexibility, you might wonder why software hasn't completely taken over. And to be clear, a lot of music production has been taken over by software running on computers. But analog circuits are still fun. They'll do things that you don't expect that can be musically interesting. And their underlying imperfections are part of the sound to the point that it's important to model those imperfections when you try to emulate them using digital signal processing. Although nowadays, I would bet that with a proper scientific double-blind study, I bet a lot of people would have a lot of trouble distinguishing the sound of an actual piece of analog hardware from recent DSP-based emulations. I think the main reason laptops haven't completely taken over is that external hardware provides a hands-on experience that's really hard to replicate with a computer screen and a mouse. Even moving away from things like laptops for a moment, this idea applies to things like guitar pedals. There's something fun about rearranging different guitar pedals and trying them in different orders by physically moving them around. That's a different experience than swapping icons on your computer screen, and it leads to different creative paths. I generally can't stand it when people, including myself, just read off of PowerPoint slides, but I think that Dave Smith makes some points better than I could, so I'm just going to read this directly. First of all, I've gotten rather tired of software synths. After making the first pro soft synth, Reality from CR Systems, a long time ago, and having more than 10 million earlier soft synths shipped. <laughs> soft. Try, <laughs> try saying that 10 times fast. Soft synths shipped. I'm finding it that I'm tired of computer-based products, and I much prefer working on real hardware. There's just something more fun as a designer to be working again on dedicated hardware that I can touch and hold. Considering the fact that software, especially music software, is regularly and easily ripped off, a hardware product becomes the ultimate dongle. And there's never been a better time to get into designing and building your own hardware. Dave Smith was able to come back with Dave Smith Instruments, basically starting as a one-person company. If you think about something simple like compilers for microcontrollers, the fact that there are so many free options now is amazing. Compilers in the early 80s went for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. People in the 70s would often create layouts by hand. You can tell this by looking at a PCB if it has curvy-looking traces. And the PCB design software that did exist was primitive and very expensive. Now you can use the free hobbyist version of Eagle, and you can export your Gerber files and upload those files to a website of some company in China, give them your credit card number, and in a few weeks they'll send you some high-quality PCBs, with solder mask and a really nice silk screen. 
And Roger Lynn, who went to work for Akai for a while, developing things like the MPC, came back with his own company as well. You can also be a one-woman company if you work in electronics, and in particular, if you're into do-it-yourself electronics, you must have heard of Adafruit. A lot of folks don't know that Adafruit, the creation of Lamour Freed, really started with an effort to recreate the TB303. Here you can also see Lamour's adaptation of the open source hardware philosophy that Adafruit carries forward to this day. Now I would like to play for you some examples from an original TB303 and similar examples from the Zoxbox. There is something weird about the files, I don't know, where the Zoxbox examples are pitched higher. So just judge based on the timbre. That was the original. Here's the Zoxbox. There, in addition to the pitch difference, there's a slight variation of timbre. I think one could probably play with the controls a little bit more and actually dial that in closer. Let's try this final example. And now the Zox box. So when they created this, they searched all over the world to try to find exact matches to the original transistors. That would be pretty hard to do now, but you could probably find transistors that are close enough. The most difficult thing to source now would probably be the match transistor pairs. I have some, but I'm not giving them up. When I first taught this class in 2006, modulars were making a big comeback. But the big manufacturers like Roland, who in the distant past had sold modular systems, weren't selling any modulars. Companies like Roland were selling things like all-in-one keyboard workstations. It was smaller hobbyist countries like Sendustries and Synthesis Technologies, Paul Schreiber's company, that really carried the torch of modular design. A large factor in bringing modulars back into the mainstream and making them affordable was Dieter Dopfer. Here you see Dopfer chatting with movie composer Hans Zimmer. For better or for worse, Dopfer's Eurorack standard has become a de facto standard in the modular synth industry. I would probably say for worse because Dopfer used an unpolarized power connector. So a lot of people have blown up their expensive Eurorack modules by plugging in the power backwards. I also probably would have gone with a plus minus 15 volt standard like Paul Schreiber did with his MOTM modules, Dopfer went with a plus-minus 12-volt standard. Also, around the time I started this class, one of the big pieces of news was that Don Buchla came back and resurrected his Buchla 200 series as the 200E. Now, from the front, this looks like the old 200 series modules, but one interesting thing about the 200E is actually that there's an internal digital control bus that lets the user save and recall settings. Now that patch storage only stores the settings of the buttons and the knobs. It obviously doesn't store the physical cable connections made between the modules, but I'm not aware of any other modular synth that has that kind of functionality. Now, an interesting point Buchla made about these modules is that they'll internally switch things from analog to digital and digital to analog, and some of the modules process their sounds entirely in analog. Some of the modules will digitize them and process them with DSP. It varies from module to module, and Don wasn't particularly worried about the particular technology used to implement the module. He worried about what the module did. And you'll see that in the kinds of modules modern designers are creating. Some of them are purely analog. Some of them are an FPGA with some analog to digital and digital to analog converters. But all of them are a lot of fun. Now, if you are taking ECE 4450 with me in the spring 2021 semester, I have a task for you. If you're not officially enrolled in the class, you can move along, but I would encourage you to stick around because you might find this interesting. So, if you are one of my 4450 students, go on Piazza and you'll find a post from me titled something like Part 5 Task. 
And what I would like you to do is to respond with answers to two questions. One is tell me what is the number of letters in your last name. I know this is silly, but I want to put something in there to make sure that you've actually watched this instead of guessed what the appropriate thing to say is based on reading other responses. The other thing I would like you to do is to watch a YouTube clip. Uh, this consists of Christian Henson, one of the co-founders of Spitfire Audio, and a media composer interviewing music educator Rick Beato. And they have a little discussion. And as part of a much broader discussion, they spend some time talking about education in the age of COVID-19. You don't have to watch the whole video. It's fairly long. Although I think if you're interested in music or current events in general, you'll find the whole thing very interesting. I'm only asking you to watch the section from 37 minutes and 8 seconds to 38 minutes and 48 seconds. And just give me a couple of sentences telling me your thoughts on this. What do you agree with? What do you disagree with? What lessons do you think we should learn from this kind of discussion or not? Just kind of give me your impressions.